Sorry, folks, just taking a minute to get set up here. The mouse seems to not want to work this morning. Anybody have audio except me? Hi, Paul. Can you hear us? Oh, okay. Sorry, just trying yes. to get set up okay. here. Hey, good morning. All right. <laughs> Can folks see uh, my screen that I'm sharing here? And does it look okay? Yes, looks good. great. Looks good. All right. Great. Um, so, welcome. Thanks for for joining us. Um, we are recording this uh, this session. Um, so the purpose of the feedback session is to gather initial feedback from members regarding the topics that you feel should be further discussed, further discussed at the public council meetings. And uh, just a reminder, same as last time, these feedback sessions are not deliberative and the feedback gathered will be summarized at the subsequent public meetings. Um, and as I mentioned, the feedback sessions are being recorded and will be posted to the Climate Act website. Uh, the topics that we have uh, set to cover today are gas system transition, buildings, industry, and health. Um, and similar to the format that we used last time, um, if you'd like, we have staff leads um, on the line that can briefly overview the changes that were presented um, to the council. Um, we've got the, the staff recommendation slides uh, pertaining to the topics that I just mentioned. Um, that have already been presented at public council meetings. We have those pulled together if folks would like uh, a bit of a refresher, um, or we can just jump right in to council member feedback and questions. Once all council members in attendance have provided an opportunity to share their feedback on a topic, then we'd move to the next topic using the same structure. So for council members, I see that, um, that we have Donna DeCarolis, Bob Howarth, uh, Gavin Dunahue, Paul Shepson, Peter Iwanowitz. Uh, um, am I missing anyone? I'm representing uh, Secretary of State Rodriguez. Oh, hi, Keisha. Thanks for joining. Um, all right. So, would the council members would you like us to 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 step through the slides, or do you want to just jump right in with your feedback since we we have ninety minutes here? My suggestion would be to just jump into the feedback again, not because uh, you know, I appreciate the time that staff might have put into preparing a, a summary, but but the devil is in the details, which is in the actual text wording. And I, I think we should really focus our time on that, given the 90 minute deadline. Absolutely. Um, so if that works for other council members, um, we'll just jump right in. So the, the first topic that we have teed up here is uh, gas system transition. And um, would anyone like to start? Bob? I, I could start if, if uh, no one else wants to. Uh, let me just go quickly through the comments. Uh, and I have 13 places where I uh, have uh, uh, some sort of an issue. Uh, starting on page uh, one, there's an addition uh, towards the bottom of the page. It says heat pump technology in extreme cold climates and space heating customers in regions of the state where current electric capacity constraints may be, in, may be more significant. I would like to see uh, those additions uh, deleted uh, for, for a couple of reasons. I think to the extent we're going to debate these issues that should be handled in the chapters on housing and electricity rather than the one on the uh, future of the gas pipeline system. And in fact, the language in, in the chapters on electricity and on housing uh, are not consistent with this. In, in fact, uh, we've already gotten guidance that the heat pump technology works just fine throughout the state, including in extreme cold climates. And to the extent that there are uh, current electric capacity constraints, 
uh, you know, those need to be addressed, and that, that's what the electric uh, chapter is about. So I'd like to see them deleted here. My next comment is on page two, and again, there's a it's an addition here, a full paragraph. It says the council has reviewed the potential use of RNG and green hydrogen in the gas system for space heating, and it, it goes on. Uh, I I feel strongly that this paragraph is more favorable to both RNG than and hydrogen than is warranted. So there, there are two things that are missing from this paragraph. One is that RNG is a scarce resource. We've seen that uh, repeatedly in the information provided uh, to the council. And it's one that has a very high greenhouse gas footprint, uh, higher than uh, fossil natural gas, according to the uh, information that I've provided to other council members. And so it's inconsistent with the CLCPA. And as for green hydrogen, uh, it says there may be situations where the existing gas system is not designed. Uh, that, that's a gross understatement. The, the system is simply not designed to take on hydrogen. Uh, California Air Resources Board has said no more than 5% hydrogen. The EPRI report with the New York Power Authority, which came out a month or so ago, shows that if you want to have a significant effect on greenhouse gas emissions by blending it in, you really need to go to 60, 70% hydrogen or more, and the system is simply just not designed for that. So I, I think this paragraph as written is misleading. Uh, next paragraph down. Let's see if I can. Comments aren't pulling along. Uh, It says, while the managed transition from fossil gas proceeds, it remains important to reduce methane emissions from the gas sector, which have been relatively flat since 2005. I strongly disagree with that assertion. I have every single time we've uh, uh, talked about this in the council. Most of the methane emissions associated with fossil gas use uh, occur outside of the state. And under the CLCPA, we, t we take uh, credit for those. Uh, they've remained at least steady as a percentage of gas use and perhaps have gone up. There's a lot of peer reviewed literature on that. They've not gone down. And since gas consumption in the state has increased markedly since 2005, more so in fact than in any other state, methane emissions have increased substantially since 2005. So I, I strongly disagree with the, that uh, statement. Uh, later down in the same paragraph, uh, it says current reporting indicates higher fugitive emissions are associated with higher quantities of leak prone pipes, leak prone pipes in need of replacement. The in need of replacement uh, is a change and it's one that I uh, disagree with. I think in many cases it makes sense to retire leaky pipes rather than to replace them. And I think we should have a, a detailed analysis uh, by some entity utilities and the PUC on that, rather than simply assert that we should replace leaky pipes. Um, bear with me while I look down. Okay, page, uh, page five, uh, the first paragraph, uh, where there's an addition that says end results in customers using other fossil fuels such as oil or propane with a higher GHG uh, emissions impact. And I would like to make two points here. One is that it seems really unlikely that anyone would convert to oil or propane. Uh, and these in any case will be prohibited in new construction. And two, it is simply not true that the greenhouse gas emissions for oil and propane are worse than for fossil gas when using the steel CPA accounting. In fact, the opposite is true. So that's that's factually wrong um, under the guidelines of the steel CPA. Searching down, hold on a bit. On page eight. Uh, in the second bullet, it says the PSC also has jurisdiction over community-based heat exchange systems. Uh, and I, uh, I'm wondering if the uh, uh, PSC can expand on this and perhaps uh, use uh, inclusive utility investments 
uh, for all building decarbonization upgrades as it's being explored and used in Illinois and California, uh, I believe. And I, I have a larger comment on that that uh, I made later that I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. But it's, it's another funding mechanism that I think we should more explicitly uh, uh, encourage the PSC to be looking into. The bottom of page eight, uh, with the additional bullet on prioritize leak prone pipes. Uh, I believe again that we should prioritize the retirement of the leakiest pipes rather than replacing them. It's expensive to replace uh, pipes. The payback period on a quality uh, new pipeline is in the neighborhood of uh, 50 years. And since uh, what we're calling for a dramatic reduction in the use of gas over the next 10, 20, 30 years, uh, I, I question the, the wisdom of, of investing in that. So if we can identify the pipes, let's make those the ones that we retire the, the fastest rather than replacing. On uh, page 10, just a general comment on table uh, X, gas system transition plan. It seems to me that many of the items in this table belong in the housing chapter rather than here. They seem sort of uh, tapped on rather than central to what uh, the chapter on the gas pipeline system is about. Uh, specifically on, on page, uh, on the next page, one of the comments is to uh, include a review of the costs and benefits associated with both the transition to electrification and potential adoption of alternative fuels, RNG, hydrogen. And uh, I just would ask again that you look at my comments above on RNG and hydrogen. Uh, we, we know a lot about that. There's already a lot of information. Uh, and I simply don't think these are appropriate for use in pipelines. And I think we should be more explicit about that, not mislead the, the people of New York. Uh, further down, there's a bullet on considering strategic use of alternative fuels aligned with the integration analysis, and I would delete that. I don't think there's any place where it's such a strategic use, I put strategic in quotation marks, uh, makes sense in New York State, given what we know about the greenhouse gas footprint of RNG and what we know about the uh, issues with hydrogen and pipeline systems. Uh, and then there's uh, alternative fuel use in the gas system must demonstrate air quality, health, and GHG benefits before implementation. That's fine, but I'd, I would add safety to that, which is a big issue, particularly for hydrogen. And let's see if I have any others. Uh, further down, it calls for independent analysis of alternative fuels, including green hydrogen and renewable natural gas. And I, I, my comment here is that it's hard to argue against independent analysis, but that makes it seem like such analysis has not been done. In fact, there's a huge amount of analysis out there already, and I, you know, I don't think we really need to call for, for more of it at the moment. Uh, we know these are not uh, good ideas. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a bullet to identify innovative uses of capital and alternative funding mechanisms, including federal funding. And, and this is where I've expanded on what I said before. Does the PSC have the authority to order utilities to offer inclusive utility investments for all building decarbonization upgrades? Uh, the Energy Star program describes that in, in the resource hub for, for all states. Uh, other states are doing this, specifically California and Illinois. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, uh, customers could get lower uh, uh, interest rates in doing it through the utility than, than through the state directly. So I'd like to see that explode. So those are my comments, and I will send them along uh, attached to the document as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> uh, Gavin. Good morning, everybody. Um, I have uh, a number of comments as well. Um, I'll start. I try to go quickly here. Um, I think everybody knows I have a real issue with the fossil term in this document. Always have. I think Donna and Dennis do. And the last meeting, I think Paul Shepson weighed in too, saying we need to be consistent and accurate with our terminology. Um, so I have strong objections uh, to the word fossil um, 
throughout this and in my judgment should be natural gas um, not fossil gas um, another area that i have some issues let's go to page four if possible um, on the bottom of the page the last paragraph um, where it says supports the denial of gas infrastructure permits in order for progress to be made in reducing. I think we should have a term in there while maintaining safety and reliability. Um, going right to denial without an analysis of safety and reliability uh, to me is, is probably a little irresponsible. It, there should be some sort of determination about reliability there and safety. Um, on page five, the top paragraph, um, customers using other fossil fuels, such as oil, propane with higher, the council supports the transition away from fossil gas use and strategic downsizing and decarbonization um, of the gas system in a way that is cost effective, reliable. <clears throat> I think the words reliable should be in there. Pardon me a second. I, I have to shut the door. I'm hearing too much background noise. Um, and then down on the bottom of page five, analysis and planning paragraph. Um, after reliability needs assessment, the analysis uh, the analysis should. Um, so we have some sort of standard here about an analysis. And when you approach to downsizing and decarbonization instead of con contraction, uh, I have a real issue with the downsizing term. It's, um, and then uh, page seven. At the bottom of the page, we talk a little bit about um, actual permitting and the issuance of permits. And I'm trying to link this language to Section 7 and the compliance that the state has with this law. Um, and I also want to put some words in there while ensuring reliability is maintained. Um, The state should consider whether <clears throat> issuance of the permits are consistent while maintaining reliability and safety again. Um, sorry for jumbling that a little bit, but I think you get my point. Uh, there needs to be some sort of analysis before denial. Um, so those are my comments um, as, as a member of the council. So thank you. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, Donna, I think your hand up was up next. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I'll try to go through mine um, fairly quickly as well. And I will provide a follow up with the matrix. Okay. Um, Great. So my first one is on page one. And well, I guess let me just uh, proceed that one by I, I did mark fossil everywhere in the document. So I think that is an open issue that we'll need to to continue to. Um, I guess, well, maybe not even to continue to discuss, we've been discussing it for a while. So I, I also had flagged um, changing the fossil gas term to natural gas to be more understandable to people consistent um, with, with how we use it today. Um, but then page one, um, it's about halfway down the first paragraph. Um, it, it's the sentence that begins the current gas system was developed to meet current demand for fossil gas. There we have one of them. And we'll need to be, I would change downsize substantially to conform with the other language. So we, we had a lot of discussion about this um, during our 10 sessions on the gas system transition in our small group meeting. So I would just conform it to be um, to strategically downsize and decarbonize, something like that, just to be consistent. So, you know, we talked a lot about having to do this strategically. There, there could be instances where we decarbonize. There could be other instances where we could downsize, but 
they're not, it's not going to just be downsizing. Um, and then, and, and you'll see that Sarah, there's a, there's a lot of other examples of using it. Um, strategic downsizing and decarbonizing. Um, I will flag on page 1, just because Bob raised it. Um, the, the insertion of the heat pump technology and cold climates, et cetera, et cetera. I do think we should keep that. I thought that was a good addition because I thought it did conform better with the discussion in chapter 12. Um, and, and it's, I think it's appropriate. So I would just suggest we. Keep that, um. Sorry, I, I go to page 2 and it was the exact paragraph, the inserted paragraph in the middle about RNG and hydrogen. My comment was, I thought it was. Unduly negative, um, frankly, so, you know, to me, I think. There's been so much discussion around this, and I thought the, um, the view was as described in the framework, which is. Um, let's keep options on the table and let's evaluate them to, to use them properly. So I think to me, this whole paragraph. Wasn't really necessary because we do discuss it in the framework. Um, I had at the bottom of that page, I had flagged around the, the, the discussion around again, pardon me for. Jumping around here, but this is near the bottom of the last paragraph. The sentence that begins current reporting indicates higher fugitive emissions are associated with higher quantities. Of leak prone pipes in need of replacement. I, I found I, I didn't follow the sentence. And so what I wondered is if we were talking about certain parts of the state, I can see the edit, but maybe some parts of the state have higher degrees of leak prone pipes than others. But overall in New York state, the inventory of leak prone pipes is is going down every year um, as utilities have PSC approved programs to to retire them um, and to replace them with plastic um, and modernize them for safety and reliability. So I guess all I was suggesting is that we take a look at that sentence for accuracy um, and, and because really the, the inventory is going down of leak prone pipes and I think collectively utilities are expecting to have them retired by the mid 2030s some sooner. Um, the next one I had was on page 4 and it was in the 3rd paragraph. Where it's around the middle, it starts off with laws such as these. That are in conflict with the requirements of the climate act must be reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. Here I was suggesting that we conform this language. Um, to the language in chapter 12, because we're talking about the same thing and I think it's a little bit more accurate to say. That we're going to evaluate what what could be in conflict that, that we aren't sure what's in conflict, perhaps. So, um, chapter 12, page 24, I think, is the language I would suggest there to be in alignment. Um, I had on page 5. In the 1st, full paragraph where the redlining begins, it's the, the 1st full sentence of the redlining. The council supports the transition away from. I would say natural gas use and the strategic downsizing and decarbonizing. I think that was Gavin's as well. Um, and I agree with including reliable. Um, bear with me as I keep going. Um, so on page 6. At the bottom bullet and where we talk about gas industry workforce. In the red line in the, in the middle of this of that paragraph where it says um, it starts. After a comma that includes a detailed timeline so that the workforce can properly prepare and considers leveraging utility worker skill sets for the transition off the gas system. I would say transition of the gas system. Um, again, keeping flexibility and options for um, the possibility of uh, low carbon fuels. And I would, if you keep going in the next sentence where it talks about. The plan should include protections for workers, including for the build out and operation of district thermal energy systems. I would also add in there after that for the decarbonization and operation of the gas delivery system with all with use of alternative fuels. Um, and this was in the framework um, on bullet two of the workforce just transition section. So that's what I would insert there. Um, and then on page 7, it's the second, well, the first new bullet regulation development and emissions reduction targets. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pardon me. The third bullet where we talk about permitting and service requirements. 
there, I would look at um, page 24 of chapter 12. And that's the section in chapter 12 that says align regulatory frameworks because we're talking about the same thing. And I think um, chapter 12 is talking about what should be reviewed and, you know, consider modifications. I think conforming it to chapter 12 is is more accurate, more appropriate of, of what we should be doing. Um, and I would just go to the bottom of page eight. And again, I know we don't want to get into a back and forth, but I, but I heard the comments about prioritizing leak prone pipes and retirement priority. I mean, I think we just all agree. I, I don't think there's any disagreement that, you know, when we're looking at leak prone pipe, we need to operate safely. That's just the time, you know, we have to have safety and reliability. So to me, I think that's correct as it's written. Um, because no matter what we need to be doing, what's necessary on the systems to keep them safe. And I'm almost at the end here. Um, I had a comment on page 11 in the framework. It's the bottom section on that page. And it's the, um, under consider role of alternative fuels and technologies. And it's the 4th bullet. In that bullet, we talk about, um. Consider the use of non wire and non pipe alternatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it talks about um, wanting to do demand management and load reduction for customer space heating and electricity needs to reduce current and future constraints on the gas on the electric grid as the state makes significant upgrades to the electric generation and distribution system. Instead of the state, or maybe in addition to the state, maybe it would be the state and utilities. So I'm just suggesting we insert utilities in some way. Um, I don't know where it is where, where, um, where Bob, you mentioned, um, the need for independent analysis. I, I, I know I read that bullet, but I guess I would just say, I agree that we keep that bullet because I do think we need to continue, um, to have independent and consider independent analysis on the topic of alternative fuels, um, and use of RNG and, and hydrogen. And then I think, um, my last comment would be on page 12 in the top section, ensure close coordination with electric system expansion. The 3rd bullet, um, where it's talking about the strategic and coordinated approach to electrification and gas system transition that includes the review of different regions, et cetera. I guess I, my comment here, and, and I will also um, mention it in chapter 12. I don't feel like chapter 12 is a, allowing for this very, very completely or effectively. So I think we need to somehow um, connect some of this framework um, in a better way, in a more direct way with chapter 12. So, sorry for all those comments. Thank you. Um, back to you, Sarah. Thank you, Donna. Um, Paul, I believe you had your hand up next. <clears throat> I, I realize we're this is not deliberative, but I, I want to make a comment about some of the proposed changes uh, related to the topic of decarbonization and adding the term um, reliable or reliability. This has become a piece of jargon, a, a weapon, in fact, used by various uh, fossil fuel uh, entities to imply that the renewable energy that we are converting to will not be reliable. And I think peppering the entire document with words like reliable and reliability effectively agrees with that notion and supports that notion that renewable energy will not be reliable. I just want to go on the record as saying I don't support adding the word reliable all through the document. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Mar Mario, you're up next. Thank you, Sarah. Um, first, uh, just on the, uh, for I guess, page three with the, uh, the key stakeholders. Uh, where it speaks to gas industry workers, it should read gas industry workers and their unions uh, as key stakeholders. And, and that would really, again, Sarah, from conversations from last week, should apply to all chapters going forward. Um, in addition to that, uh, the implementation of, of any aspects of the plan that lists specific agencies uh, for involvement 
uh, should include DOL and the Office of Just Transition. Um, in terms of lists of the entities to be consulted, again, it should be workers, unions, Department of Labor, and Office of Just Transition uh, moving forward. And then uh, for this section, and then again, I'll, I'll just way I don't have to waste everybody's time going forward in each of the sections. Um, the standards we requested previously uh, should be applied to all uh, the, the comprehensive labor uh, language, meaning prevailing rate, project labor agreements, neutrality, uh, labor peace, uh, privatization prohibitions, uh, maintenance of uh, for licensing standards, uh, reemployment of displaced workers by New York, by American. Um, so again, as a more of a comprehensive for each of the chapters. Uh, in terms of um, getting back to just the gas, I think probably page 12 under the ensure just transition for the gas industry workforce doesn't necessarily matter where uh, it's placed, but there needs to be uh, financial incentives for the retention of, of the gas system workforce during the transition and um, financial incentives for businesses or, or not for profits should be conditioned upon meeting those labor standards. Um, and again, workplace safety and health and getting back to what uh, I think Donna had mentioned also on page eight between the, regarding the leak proof pipes, uh, keeping them safe. I just want to be clear, keeping them safe specifically, at, at least first off for the workers who are actually there. So I just, I want to make, be really clear about that. Uh, and the last piece, just maintaining flexibility throughout the document and particularly on the technology mix. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Mario. Peter? Yeah, hi, thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Um, I, I, can I just start off with a quick question? I know that we didn't go through the overview, but maybe we were all benefited a little bit of this. There's a big addition here on pages 10 through the end, uh, I guess page 14. Um, could someone just sort of run through the thinking of adding that language in there? Because um, it seems to me like it's an overview of the presentations that the council has gotten in the past, but um, so I don't know if Jessica's here on this call or not. It's hard to see all the names of who's here, who's not. I think Jess Waldorf is on. Uh, Jess, are you able to chime in on that one? Yep, I'm here. So if if you could maybe just just sort of walk through the the rationale for adding in the language under table on on enumerated right now, but table X gas emissions is 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yes, yep. Um, so the table that was added into the revised version of the gas system transition chapter reflects the uh, framework that was developed by the gas system transition subgroup and presented at the prior council meeting. Um, the language, uh, for the most part, should directly match the last publicly reported version of this framework. Right. Okay. That's what I thought. Um, all right. I may may return back to a couple of comments on that. Just with that, if we if we maintain that, I know Bob has thought it, it belonged in the building sector uh, earlier. Um, on page one of the chapter for gas transition, um, I guess at some point we have to figure out what term we're going to use: fossil, not fossil. It seems to kind of go back and forth. Um, also on page one, there's reference to the power generation being decarbonized. I think we should say exactly what the law says, that it should be zero emissions there. Um, sorry to be nitpicky, but I think it's an important distinction. On page two, um, whatever we decide in terms of the back and forth we've had during this discussion about RNG and hydrogen and, and whatnot, and I would like to say that I just want to be associated and, and support all the comments that Bob Howarth um, laid out earlier. So mine are in addition to his, I just don't want to copy them again, but um, I think we need, if, we, if we're looking at RNG there to be consistent with what we came out of with the alt fuel working group, it should be strong consistency with, with sections of law 7.2 and 7.3 of the CLC CPA, um, particularly as it relates to disadvantaged communities and the co-pollutant tests. Um, on page seven, I actually have a different point of view than Donna has um, on this chapter as it relates to buildings. I think um, this language is the better way to just sort of describe it because in the buildings chapter, there's ample text there that talks about the challenges to electrification and adoption of either ground source or air source heat pumps 
because of laws like this that have been flagged and need to be changed. And I think this language is the one that, that sets the right vision and direction for the legislature who will need to amend the law. And I think it's been cons it is consistent sort of throughout um, the heavy emphasis on electrification of buildings in the transition and this being an impediment to that, or at least a challenge as identified in the buildings chapter. So count me in the categories. I like this language. Let's keep it. Um, and I guess going back to the chart, then um, on page 13 of the chart, um, there's a, a piece in here and I just, it, it's related to my last uh, big comment there, but identify needed changes to laws and regulations for alignment with the climate act. I don't know if somebody can to, to talk about what might be needed there, or if there's further language coming out of the gas transition subgroup. Um, but what are we talking about when we say review the creation of newer modifications to existing statutory provisions? Are we talking about amendments to the climate law, different sections of law? Someone can maybe just answer that. I, I may have no more comment, or I may have a follow-up comment. Sure, Peter, this is Jessica. I'll take a stab at answering that. Um, so basically that language is meant to reflect, you know, the need to review other statutory or regulatory provisions that may seem to be in conflict with the climate law um, and make recommendations, you know, for necessary statutory or regula regulatory changes to align with the work that's outlined in the um, scoping plan here. Right. And so with that sort of contemplated what has been identified appropriately so on page seven related to the hundred foot rule and the language around that. That's correct. Yep. All right. Okay. Thanks, I appreciate that further information. That's it for me. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Jessica, for um, filling in here. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> um, oh, your hand is still up. Is that, uh, you're not, okay. Uh, Gavin, your hand is back up. Hi, um, just a couple small things that I missed. Mario made me think about something. Um, Page 10, um, development of the plan should be led by DPS, blah, blah, blah. Talks about groups that should be involved in consultation with utilities. Um, I think it also should be in consultation with electric generation owners. Um, that's left out. Um, and then on page seven, at the top, the recent amendment to the public service law to allow utilities to become holistic energy providers. Um, based on that law, I think it should be phrased thermal energy providers. That's what the law allows the utilities to do. So, sorry for jumping back in, but those were two things that just crossed my plate here. Thanks. Got it. Thank you. Any more? Um... Comments on the gas system transition chapter. All right, then uh, we'll move to buildings then. So, Sarah, I have a question before before I raise my hand, and that is so like, I have a lot of them here. Should we be going? page by page, or how do you want to do this? Do you really want us to just take turns? I don't want to, you know, take, you know, I can try to be concise, but I'm afraid I, I might not be able to. So what, what would you suggest? I would say we're, we're trying to capture as much feedback as we can. So if you have it already, you know, or easily populated in the, 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 the feedback matrix, I would say you could uh, share that with us and then maybe, um, you don't need to go into as much detail here, but maybe you just want to hit a couple of the highlights. Um, but um, yeah, I guess if, if you are providing written feedback, the sooner we can get that from you, the better, just so we can make sure that we're, we, we've got time to get through it and make sure that we've um, got everything appropriately teed up for the next council meeting on Monday. I'll also jump in um, like much like what Peter did. If you have questions that will help better inform your feedback, you have staff on the line that can answer those questions. So that's also a good opportunity to use this time for that purpose. So 
So any comments on buildings? <clears throat> Donna? I'm trying to let someone else go first, but uh, um, I'll, I'll try to keep mine high level, okay, rather than going through page by page. So, one was, um, I, I guess I would just suggest, and I can give you the first example. You know, I'm in the camp, it, it, as we've talked about, of keeping options on the table and maintaining flexibility. And so, um, one observation is, and, and, and I see it um, in a number of places, where we talk about um, emissions free or focusing, and I know we, we've talked about this a lot, um, exclusively on electrification of buildings. If we could somehow at least recognize um, electrification and decarbonization, because as, as we've talked about a lot, in some instances, it's gonna be difficult to electrify, costly to electrify. Um, so I'll have some, some comments suggesting that in specific places. So trying to keep, um, all these options, you know, just keeping the, the availability of alternative fuels as a possibility. Um, the other kind of general comment I had, and, I, and again, I'll, I'll have some specific places, is, is we think about, um, and I know, Paul, I, I heard your comment about reliability, um, and I think w when I think about reliability, it's, it's not just the power grid generation reliability, it's the delivery to consumers, and so I'm really thinking about um, how, you know, some way to just recognize that energy diversity is important. Um, you know, multiple ways of delivering energy is important. And so using the gas system, at least recognizing it as a way to provide resiliency um, from weather interruptions because it is storm hardened and underground. And, um, you know, we can, we can use that during the transition. So that's just another comment I'll have throughout. Um, one other that I'll just throw in right now is we, we talked about it at, I think it was the October 13th meeting where staff went through comments from the buildings chapter from, you know, from the public. And I really thought we were going to be looking at a kind of a greater expansion of the distinctions between different parts of the state and among different parts of the state, you know, different buildings, um, different uh, weather patterns, um, different degrees of resource availability. And I thought we would be looking at maybe broader options for different parts of the state. So, you know, specifically at the bottom of page two in, in this footnote, I've, I've read it quite a lot where we talk about, um, you know, having a small sector of heating that's being electrified, that's gonna need a backup source of energy. I really think, and, I, and I'll, I'll put it in my feedback that we should be considering um, dual heat pathways. And we've talked about it a lot and I don't think um, and I know I raised it at prior council meetings. Can't we further analyze that? And, and I get that we're not doing any more analysis to the integration, um, you know, work that that's been done in the modeling. But I do think we need to consider dual heat pathways as a real opportunity in the near term. And and using again renewable natural gas is in that footnote, um, talking about it being not zero emissions. And I guess I just want to flag that. And I know we've talked about that too. Is there somewhere that we can just flag that policy accounting would enable um, this to be an option where we could actually get the benefit to the heating sector of avoided emissions that, that would be um, captured through something like, um, you know, biogas renewable, but renewable natural gas from whether it be dairy or um, food scraps and, and the like. So, you know, these are my general comments. And I think, let me just see if I, the other big one is, and I'll, and I'll just raise this one now so I can give someone else the floor. Um, and it, it really starts on page seven, and then it gets into um, section B2, where I would just say that um, specific dates for the conversion of existing heating equipment is very concerning to me. What, what I thought was really, when I reread this for the first time and reread that that everything in this chapter, it says on page two, is um, is dependent upon the zero emissions, 100% zero emissions electricity by 2040. And we, we've seen the New York ISO has concerns about that being accomplished. Um, and then also energy efficiency improvements in all buildings, all buildings 
um, to reduce energy demand by 30 to 50 percent. And that's that's a big lift. So I guess to to have all that as as a kind of the requirement to be able to support this timeline for mandating electrification of heat, for example, beginning in 2030 as equipment fails, that's just a concern to me. And it is to me a reliability and a resiliency concern. Um, and I think what I was hoping to see is some better connection with kind of the um, deliberate review process that is lined up in uh, the gas system transition chapter. So I guess with that, I would, um, I'll give you the specific details um, in the matrix. So thank you. Thank you, Donna. <clears throat> uh, Bob Howard. Yeah, thank, thank you, Sarah. I'll, I'll just uh, give a couple of highlights. I've, I've written detailed uh, 27 detailed comments. I'll, I'll just pass those on to you in writing, but, uh, but a couple of things. I mean, overall, I, I think the chapter's uh, going in, in the right direction. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I, I still ob object to uh, any thought that renewable natural gas uh, will play any role whatsoever in, in, uh, in heating. The, the evidence there in the peer reviewed literature is that it's, uh, has greenhouse gas emissions that make it unacceptable under the CLCPA. That's been demonstrated in our discussions. It's in the literature there. Uh, and it's a small resource, and we've consistently said that it would be best used uh, uh, on site and, and not used for uh, putting into pipelines and therefore not for, for home heating. So I really want to stress that again. I, I also think that the uh, chapter is a little bit too negative on ground source heat pumps. It alludes to the fact that uh, they have some advantages over air source heat pumps, but, uh, but they're more expensive. And there's a, uh, a new study which came out uh, just last month, uh, specifically for New York, looking at new construction and comparing uh, air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps with uh, either natural gas or propane uh, as heating elements. And it looked specifically across the climatic gradients of, of, of the state. And there are a couple of things there, which uh, I think we really need to capture in this chapter, which are not in there. W one conclusion is that ground source heat pumps are actually cheaper than air source heat pumps everywhere in the state. Uh, once you look at the uh, energy costs over uh, uh, a 12 year period of, of uh, instituting them. And I think that's an important thing. So we're being too negative on ground source heat pumps. Uh, those cost differentials become greater the colder it gets. So in the North Country, it, they're even more cost effective, less so on Long Island. And it also says that both air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps are more cost effective to the new homeowner than propane anywhere in the state. And uh, for natural gas, for the most part, the only exception being that natural gas has a slight economic edge over air source heat pumps. Uh, in growing zone uh, six, Long Island, say, but not over ground source heat pumps. So I, I really want to make sure we we capture that. Uh, also, uh, on this whole idea of that uh, for retrofitting, we need to heavily uh, weatherize or uh, insulate in order to to retrofit and put in heat pumps. That that's factually wrong. Uh, and I'm sitting here in my house right now. I'm looking out the window. There's snow on the ground. It's cold here today. Uh, I've got an 1890s farmhouse. Uh, we did not super insulate it. We did convert to a ground source heat pump eight years ago to the to the day. Uh, we've been saving money ever since, uh, even though we didn't go with the insulation. It is simply not true that you have to have a super insulated house for these technologies to work. And I would add that uh, even if the grid were 100% fossil fuel, which of course it isn't anywhere in the state, that greenhouse gas emissions go down when you move to a either an air source or a ground source heat pump uh, powered by the electricity. And so we're not dependent on the emissions going down by uh, greening the grid. Of course, uh, the CLCPA mandates that we green the grid as well, and that's happening. But, but even in the transitional state at any point in time, including today, which would be the worst possible time we're going to have, it's going to get uh, increasingly better moving forward. Uh, emissions go down immediately for anyone that retrofits their home with a 
either an air source or a ground source heat pump. And I, I really think those points need to be uh, more centrally highlighted in the chapter. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> uh, Peter. Peter, you are on mute. Sorry, took my hand down and didn't off mute. Um, wrong button. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I want to just sort of start at, at the beginning because I just acknowledging, um, I think this chapter was an excellent chapter. I've thought that since the draft and, you know, acknowledgement of the costs and how to address them and move forward, I think has done a really good job in this chapter um, and in our overall benefits too. So I wanted to just start with that. Um, on page two, the section about RNG and hydrogen, um, it, it does seem to be inconsistent with the all fuel working group perspective here. So I would urge us to sort of go back to that. I mean, my big question, and then I'll ask it rhetorically here is, you know, that, that working group suggested it should be used on site. I agree with Bob Howard's sort of um, comments made earlier. Um, but, you know, how is the gas going to get there um, if, if we're moving it on site so we can build out infrastructure? So I really suggest we look at that language on page two and make it consistent with where the, where the working group landed on that. Um, and Maureen's kind of walked us through in a couple of different meetings, but also in the most recent meeting. Just tr trying to skim through my notes real quickly. I'll, I'll put them more and more detailed into the language. Um, Again, on page 24, um, I think that language is not consistent with language elsewhere in this chapter that identifies um, these types of things like the 100 foot rule and other hookups to be uh, challenges towards um, cost effective and electrification. So I would urge us to use the language that's in the, uh, the gas transition chapter on page 7 of that chapter then, rather than this language. I think it's more consistent with the uh, highlighting the challenges there. Um, on page 25, I think where it's appropriate, we should be uh, consistent with the statutory obligations of section 7.2 um, and really highlight that, that this is what agencies need to be doing there. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to move through pretty quickly. Um, let me hop to page 32. Um, and this is the language about thermal networks. Um, um, I think we use the word clean in a very broad sense, but I think what we need uh, in this area is to be uh, identifying zero emissions so to be consistent with the law um, in terms of zeroing things out. And then also on page two, I think we need some language here to ensure that the energy source for thermal networks uh, should be zero emissions to make sure that that's consistent with all the sections of the law. Um, and so I would, I would encourage us to add language there that the energy sources that would then provide uh, the thermal networks um, um, would be zero emissions. We don't want to get a situation like we're combusting waste or, or other fuels uh, to drive those systems. It should be um, electrically driven and from the renewable energies the sources there. Um, and I, unfortunately, I'm going to have to hop after I make these comments, but I'll be back on this afternoon. And, but I'm interested to see that on... Page 37, we talk about the health impacts of gas appliances indoor, which is important, but I, um, I'm not sure it was fully captured in the health chapter update. But again, I'll, I'll try to participate in this afternoon session. And Henry, you and I maybe can have a discussion about that because um, it kind of moves it out of this chapter into that chapter. And I'm not sure that the health chapter adequately covered it, but maybe it did. Um, those are my comments. Thank you, Peter. Any other comments on buildings? Donna. Thanks, Sarah. I figured I'd just throw in two more since uh, it looks like we were nearing the end. Two that I missed that I just wanna mention. One was on page six. I would just suggest um, that we add at the top where we talk about the colder regions that we add Buffalo and Western New York um, to the to the list where we have the North Country, Mohawk Valley, and Capital, because looking at the degree days, um, they are. So I I can give you data if if you need that. And the other one I just wanted to mention because I don't want to be I want I want to just say I thought it was a good edit on page sixteen at the top where we had some preamble to the um, to the specific dates 
where it's being suggested that the code modifications occur. Um, I thought it was really good to add the section that said, in addition to the considerations required by the Climate Act at SAPA, and it talks about, you know, public engagement comment, um, more analysis about technical industry and grid readiness. And I would add to the grid readiness and local electric distribution system readiness. And I wanted, I hate to just launch this out there. I think um, Jessica's still probably on the call. So, but, but to me, I would suggest any way that we can align this with with what's being suggested for the gas transition framework, since that's um, being done um, and overseen by the PSC, along with a lot of others, of course, but the PSC being um, responsible for reliability, affordability, just and reasonable rates and all of that, I would just somehow suggest they get worked into this, this section as um, being important to it. So thank you. Thanks, Donna. Sarah, Amanda. Quick direct response. Go for it. So Donna, it would be very helpful to see the degree days that you're referencing for Buffalo. The, the data that we were referencing does show a very significant difference in terms of the coldest temperatures in the North Country um, as compared to Buffalo, for example. And you know so what? it would be very I, helpful to see your data. Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to do that, Vanessa. I didn't ha I couldn't find the North Country, but what I did find is Albany, so I was looking at Buffalo, Niagara Falls, Jamestown versus Albany, and I have it and I'll provide it. It's the 30 year um, NOAA uh, and it's the 30 years ended 2021, I believe, you know, that rolling 30. Yeah, happy to do that. Thank you. All right, any final feedback on buildings? Okay, let's move to industry then. Any yes. comments? Sarah, I've got oh, a, a hop. I just wanted to just all, this, it looks like somebody's joined a long while back by phone number. I don't know if we've identified the phone in caller from the 914 with the last digit 71. Yes, that's me, Emily Alkowitz from NIPA. I was trying to get on in the teams, but no one let me in through the waiting room. So I just joined via phone. Emily Alkowitz from New York Power Authority. Great. Yes, we shifted these over to WebEx, so we're not on Teams anymore. Um, any comments on industry? Um, Gavin. Um, I'll be brief. I don't have a specific language change here, um, but. Um, it's a consistency issue. Maybe it's a tone issue. Um, I'd ask the staff to try to take a look at this. <clears throat> um, I am very concerned about consistency and applicability of section seven of the statute and how that is going to be applied to various industries. Um, for example, Micron has announced, the governor announced that in, in Onondaga County, um, and what I've read, it talks about being fueled by uh, all renewable energy, which which is a good thing if it can happen. But I don't hear that from Global Foundries and their Title V permit expired in May of this year and is still pending at the Department of Environmental Conservation. Uh, a number of the people that I work for permits are still pending for Title V at DEC. So what I'm looking for in the industry section, I want to ensure that we're not having, um, and maybe this is the wrong word, but it's a, just a, a word I'm using in a small group, double standards. Uh, as how we're going to apply Section 7 compliance with major economic development announcements, whether it's the Bills Stadium, whether it's Micron, whether it's Penn Station, how Section 7 is complied with by all industries I don't think is, is, is written in a, in a strong enough way. And I think I've made my point. Um, so I just give you that as feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, Bob. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I just have uh, two comments really on the, on the uh, 
industry chapter one is on page four under the vision for 2050. And the sentence is mostly there from before. It's got a slight change. It's capturing my attention more than it did before. So my apologies for not raising this perhaps a year ago. But it says most industrial facilities need high temperature heat in their manufacturing process. More or less true. And solutions to reduce emissions from industrial heat could include green hydrogen and or other alternative fuels as well as carbon capture use and storage. I, I have three thoughts there. One is that uh, electricity can provide every bit as much heat as hydrogen or any fuel. And so it's this sort of implies that we're not going to be able to do it with electricity, and that's that's simply not uh, not the case. And on the other hand, uh, I really am not aware of any alternative fuel that would provide the sort of heat that electricity can or that green hydrogen can. So I would delete the uh, alternative fuels uh, from that. Or uh, per perhaps someone who put that in can tell me what they had in mind and give me an example. But uh, in the literature I've seen, you can't get RNG say won't give you that level of heat. So. And the other comment I have is on page 12, or there's an addition saying uh, the safety of green hydrogen at the end of a bullet there. I, I, I like that. Uh, but I would add also the greenhouse gas consequences of, of green hydrogen. And, and there are two aspects to that. One is that uh, it, it's becoming increasingly clear that although hydrogen itself is not a greenhouse gas, that uh, hydrogen emissions to the atmosphere affect other greenhouse gases, including methane. It uh, makes them uh, stay in the atmosphere longer, and therefore hydrogen leakage does have greenhouse gas consequences. And so we should analyze that. And also there's an opportunity cost uh, because green hydrogen is made from renewable electricity, and we might be better off using scarce renewable electricity in other ways, particularly over the coming decade or so in transitions. Uh, and, and so simply jumping to green hydrogen um, may increase greenhouse gas emissions relative to other ways that we could use the renewable electricity. I'd appreciate a little bit of language addition there if that's, if that's possible. Otherwise, I'm fine with the chapter. Thank you. Right, any other comments on the industry chapter? Donna? Thanks, Sarah. Mine was really a question, and it was on page one where we um, mentioned Appendix C. Is Appendix C included, or have we seen that? I apologize if we have, because. I... Oh, let me see what Appendix C is. Appendix C was the Just Transition Working Group recommendations to the Council. So okay, those... so this is talking about, okay, so it says it sets out a method by which the state could define energy or emissions intensive and trade exposed industries. Right, these were the recommendations from the Just Transition Working Group. That, that's what is in Appendix C. Okay, so. okay. All right, I think, I think that answers it. You know, I heard, um, I guess I was just curious what more we might know about how we would define who might be, um, well, I, I, maybe it's a bit to Gavin's point, who would be potentially carved out in some way um, of the requirements. So, so I don't know if, if, you, if that answers that or if that's anything we should be discussing further in this chapter. So I guess I, I just leave that with you as a question. Do we have, um... I'm looking, I'm not seeing Jamie Dickerson. Do we have anybody from DOL that might um, be able to speak to the Just Transition Working Group recommendations? If not, we can... Um... Hi, Sarah, this is Yvonne. I'm sorry, what was, what was the question? So I think Donna was looking at, um, there was a reference to Appendix C in, uh, the, in the industry chapter. And she was curious as to as to what uh, Appendix C was and looking at the draft scoping plan. It looks like it's the, the just transition working group recommendations to the council. And she was curious uh, if there was any um, material in that that spoke to how there might be carve outs for particular um, 
industries or um, or something like that. And was this specifically related to to leakage, Donna, or you just? Yes, I think yep. so. Okay. However, it's defined by the statute, which I think that's how it's defined. But yeah. Oh, uh, I'm mm, I'm not sure, but I I'll 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 see what I can find out. Okay, we'll have to follow up back up with you on that one, Donna. <clears throat> um, was that it, Donna, or any other? That was it. Okay. Thank and you. Gavin, um, back to you. Looks like your hands up. Um, mine is more of an issue that throughout the document we have a lot of terms that are undefined. Whether you agree with fossil gas or you don't, undefined. Peter raised the issue at the last meeting about green hydrogen, undefined. A lot of terms are undefined throughout the document. For example, in this section, we don't have a definition of energy intensive. What does that mean? That sort of gets to what I think I'm talking about and what Donna's alluding to as well. Trade exposed, what does that mean? Um, again, <clears throat> we're looking to make sure that the statute is applied evenly and fairly. Um, if there are carve outs, what is the definition of energy efficient, energy intensive, for example? Again, I don't have language, but that's a further explanation of, of where I'm coming from. Thanks. Understood. Thanks, Gavin. Any more comments on the industry chapter? Right, so rounding us out, um, we've got the health chapter. Any comments on that one? Bob. Sorry, I took me a minute to unmute there. Uh, <laughs> thank you, sir. Uh, I, I, uh, I only have two, two comments, maybe one question and one comment. Let me start with the comment and then and then go to the question. Uh, overall, I, I really like the chapter. I think it's uh, strong and it's it's right on. Uh, on page, I think it's 21, uh, where we're talking about uh, wood smoke exposure. And, you know, I, I of course agree that wood smoke uh, can be bad, often is, is bad, and perhaps I'm being a little defensive because in addition to my ground source heat pump, I do use a, a backup <laughs> wood stove for heating. Uh, I'd like to just see us distinguish, perhaps in a sentence or two, between the various ways that uh, wood is used for, for heating in, in the state. And, you know, a, a lot of, of people have uh, high efficiency, low emission stoves. They do still emit some particles, but they're they're pretty good. Uh, and on the other hand, there's, uh, at least in my part of the state, a large number of in the yard, uh, big combustion systems, which often just continuously belch out large amounts of smoke. And it's my understanding that, you know, those in fact are in violation of, of regulations, but there's no enforcement for it. And so uh, I would hazard a guess that uh, if there, if we really have a problem with wood smoke in the state, that it's 99% uh, you know, a relatively small number of, of of users who have these systems which are dirty and and the rules aren't being enforced. So, and perhaps I'm wrong on that, but that that's my sense. And uh, so maybe it's half a question and half a comment. My other uh, comment or question is on page twenty. Uh, is it? There's an addition on page 20, which I, I really like. It starts with, in addition, homes with uh, gas stoves have on average 50 to 400% higher concentrations of NO2, et cetera, et cetera. And I, you know, I agree with everything I see there. I'm glad to see it in there. Uh, it's almost buried at the end of the chapter. I might put it further up, but uh, the only, I have two questions. One of which is, can we, and I think Peter had mentioned this before, can some of this language, uh, strengthen how we talk about problems with uh, in-home gas cooking that's uh, in the buildings chapter. And then secondarily, in terms of the asthma and health risks and all associated with that, uh, does anyone know if if those costs 
are captured in what we've had uh, to date in the analysis, the integration analysis that Carl Moss and others have, have given, or are these new additional costs, in which case we should emphasize them? So that's a question. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Do we have an answer on the um, on the question about the costs in the in the integration analysis? Hey, Vlad's here, and I um, I'm uh, ashamed to admit that I was focused on something else as Bob. You were asking that question, so my apologies. Could you mind repeating it? Yeah, I no, could, no, I no worries. It's hard to drift off a little bit here. Uh, my question. I, I was complimenting the uh, the presentation on on the. Uh, Issues of N2O from cooking with gas in your home and, and also the asthma carryover and all benzene exposure and things like that. So they're, they're clearly, uh, uh, you know, economic issues associated with that. And, and my question is, were those economic issues captured in the integration analysis that uh, has been presented to us earlier, or are these uh, additional Public health costs that we haven't actually captured before in our analysis uh, overall for the for the council. But go ahead, Hillel. I, I now that I know the question, I also know that you're better to answer it than me. <laughs> sure, this is a Hillel Hammer from Nyserda. Um, yeah, we've um, so to I guess there was two parts to that question. Um, we did update as best we could from everything that was available to us in the health chapter. Um, and that's the text I believe that you were referring to. So there are some, some good studies out there that give us decent information about some of these connections, what we know and what we don't know. Um, it may be possible to quantify some of that. And what I mean by that is that um, even these studies are some, somewhat limited, so they're not going to capture um, all of the potential effects that we don't know about. What we do know about is the connection between, there is some connection between uh, gas cooking and asthma um, uh, incidents in children. Um, and we've, we've been trying to take a look at that, but we don't have full numbers on it. Um, I, I'm not assuming that that's a, I'm going to use a technical term here, a huge number um, sure. in the scale of, of the analysis that we've presented, but it's not included in there to date. So we do have statements about the fact that our health analysis in general is conservative. There are several things that are probably not included in there. This would be one of them. I think maybe just adding that as a one additional sentence to that paragraph might be worth doing. And I understand the difficulties of adding too much quantitative aspect to it, but asthma is a you know it's an expensive public health issue in our state, and so to the extent that uh, N two O and N O two et cetera contributes to it, uh, you know it's, it's I think it's important. I, I like the paragraph, so it's not a complaint, just a suggestion. Thank you. All right, Paul, your hands up. Sorry, my hand went up uh, back when Gavin was speaking about the last chapter. Do you want to finish the health chapter before? I don't have any comments on this chapter, but I, I do want to speak to. Sure. The comments Gavin was making. Sure. Sorry about missing that. Uh, Donna, is your hand up for this chapter? Yeah, just a just a quick comment. And I guess all I was going to say is is. You know, with regard to cooking, you know. I, I, I would just add, I know we say this is on page 20 with poor ventilation. 1 source of natural gas. With high levels of trace gases was projected to result in levels of benzene, et cetera, et cetera. I guess when you, when you read, I, I feel like this is an incomplete section. Is there some way to at least reference that there are indoor air quality issues with every form of cooking and that. The real key in is, is to ventilate properly and I'm not. You know, nobody's going to be happy with me trying to defend gas cooking. I understand that, but um, I've been in the business, you know, 40 years, and we have never had an incident that has been attributed to gas cooking. So, you know, I just want to pass that on. So, if without trying to refute um, the studies, because the studies are the studies, 
Um, I guess I would just say ventilation is important regardless of what form of cooking. So maybe you're the, I see, I see your expert might have something to say, but I just wanted to raise that. So thank you. Yeah. Can I, can I add to what uh, Donna has said? Sure. I, I have to say, I, I agree completely with her. There are lots of studies about in indoor cooking um, that produces particulate matter and other species that, that contribute to uh, respiratory disease, including asthma. Uh, and she's right, it, it's, it's all about ventilation. Cooking with natural gas wouldn't be a problem if you had an overhead hood. Uh, but, you know, fried foods, uh, frying with a, an electric range produces indoor air pollutants that are hazardous, including benzene and PAHs. And um, so I'm just supporting Donna's comments. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Hillel, did you want to? Um, respond to Donna's statement there. I, I just see that you put your video on. Well, yeah, I, I could just say I think that's a good that's a good comment, and we can certainly emphasize uh, the importance of ventilation. That's always always true, and it's also important when we're taking energy efficiency implementation steps to make sure that we're actually improving ventilation, um, especially in cases where existing ventilation is not is not good. Um, that's definitely an important consideration, and I think we've tried to make that statement in several places, but we can certainly make sure that that's in there. Um, I, I do want to note that we took great care in writing that section to cite what we know and, and, and to cite it carefully. So um, when we're saying there is a connection between gas cooking specifically and asthma, um, that's citing a meta study um, that, that went through all of the studies specifically on this topic. That goes beyond what we know about particulate matter from cooking, which is also a very important concern. So we, we, I think it's important to have both of those things in there. What you were mentioning, Donna, specifically was um, in regard, I think, to the toxics. And so, again, we were, we were careful to not um, allude to conclusions that are not in there. So we're saying we know what we know. There is more study that could be needed there as well. Um, and it could be a concern depending on what kind of additional constituents are in the gas. Um, it has been shown in some of those cases. Um, we're, we're, we're putting out there what we know. Thanks, hello. Any other... Uh... Feedback on the health chapter. All right, then I think we're back to you, Paul, um, with respect to the industry chapter. Well, yeah, really just Gavin's comments uh, about defining terms, and, and it strikes me that at least we should ask the question does the full document need a glossary of terms? For example, if we use the term fossil gas, um, it needs a definition, you know, that I, I guess we mean thermogenic methane that has a bunch of other things in it, just like natural gas is mostly methane and has a bunch of other things in it. But, but if you use a term like fossil gas, um, lots of people who are comfortable with the term natural gas won't know w what that is. And I never understood completely what trade exposed industries meant and so on. And there, there are terms throughout the entire document that many people who will read it will wonder what that is. And would it help us to have a glossary of terms that we pay some attention to? Uh, you know, energy intensive industries and so on, trying to make sure that we're clear about what we mean. It's Great a piece point. of work. Thank you. Any final comments on any of the chapters that we've discussed here today? Uh, just a question and no further comments on these. When 
that were the remaining set of chapters. When are we likely to receive those? That's uh, we expect to get that to you today. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Um, not seeing any other uh, feedback here. I think we'll go ahead and wrap just a little bit early. Um, we have another session to talk about these chapters uh, at 2 o'clock today, if anybody is interested in join, joining. Um, but certainly, uh, any of the feedback that you've shared here, we've captured, and uh, you don't need to, to reiterate any of that feedback if you do join this afternoon. So, thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.